restrictions have on people. Thereby, we don't expect the committee to meet only um, organized bodies or institutions. We also expect you to meet non-formal organizations and the poor people or the vulnerable who are more affected than anybody. Therefore, Honorable Speaker, what I expect from the committee is to come up with recommendations. What are we, or what we can do, or what we should do from now on? Honorable Speaker, we gave the executive 45 days. And this 45 days is coming to an end. We want to know what effect does it has? Because our people are suffering, honorable speaker. If you look at the nature of the virus, it seems that the virus is not going anywhere soon. If the virus is not going anywhere soon, then what we are expected of is what other countries are doing, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, other countries are opening up strategically. If the virus is here to stay, we should also be thinking of how to open up strategically. We cannot continue to stay, uh, to close down. If we know the plight of our people, then we should think about, because there are so many things to this, Honorable Speaker. During these 45 days, a lot of things has happened and is still happening. Somebody made mention of it, that in our hospitals, people are not even going there to get medical treatment. We expect the committee to find out from these hospitals why People who are sick are staying in their homes, not going to the hospital to get treatment. Honorable Speaker, I was privileged to be very close to my health facility or the hospital in Bundo. Not long ago, a man came there who has a diabetes, was sitting at home for more than a month without coming to the hospital for treatment. And when he came back, it was too little, too late for the med medical personnel to help him because his leg, in fact, was smelling very badly. He could not get any, he did not come to the hospital for any treatment. He was just sitting at home because he think that it is not safe to go to the hospital. So you could see that this um, COVID-19 is not killing people, but instead because of its effect, people are dying silently in their homes without getting proper treatment. And the health facility and almost everybody in the country now is jumping up coronavirus, coronavirus. I'm even afraid if we are not coronavirus nice, honorable speaker. <clears throat> Honorable Speaker, 
As of now, we don't need any more extension of this state, state of public emergency. I mean, there should be a reason why we need to extend the public emergency. And the reason should be clear. The situation in Bundu is very, very critical. And I think honorable members, all of us here should understand that. Honorable Speaker, the first day of this coronavirus, we were told that it is from Bundu. And after all the people that have been quarantined, who has contact with the, the victim who died, after 14 days we are all tested uh, negative. Meaning none of them did not get it. And my community find it very difficult to understand whether actually is that virus that killed that man. Because we expect all the people he have contact with, he was living with. He was living with people in the same house, they was in the same place, was it in the same mosque. And none of those people got coronavirus. And the the the, the Victim, uh, sorry, the, the nurses also who attended, who attended to him, none of them also got coronavirus. And the family start wondering if, in fact, it is coronavirus who killed the man. So it will be very, it will be important if the Ministry of Health held try to update citizens, no matter what, tell us actually what has happened if there is any decision or later on confirm them. It is not in fact Corona who killed the man. I think they should be able to go back to people and tell them the reality. You see, if we don't talk to people, they also will have their own perceptions about things. And we have, nothing to, we have nothing we can do to change those perceptions unless we communicate it well to them. And no matter how the situation is, honorable speaker. So, 
For that being the case, I, I think many, even the National Assembly members, the perception they have, I think they should revisit it. Honorable Speaker, it's not that Gambians don't believe that the virus exists. The problem they have is whether it is in the Gambia here. Point of honor, Honorable Speaker. Point of observation. Who is raising point of observation? What's your point of observation, please? <laughs> you, honorable member for Bundung Kakunda, you allowing him? I'm not. I'm okay. sorry. Sit down. Okay. Sit. It's okay. I know why he want to raise the point. <laughs> So, Honorable Speaker, the committee also, um, Honorable Chair, I know you have li limited, you had a limited time. Time was not on your side. But I think there are other committees that you could use to help you in your work. Because there was a lot, so much expected from you. The whole government was expecting you to come with a report that will highlight most of the things that are not explained or that they don't know about that is going on. You may mention that due to time, you could not reach MOPSI, Minister, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Though the committee took it upon themselves to call the ministry, and the ministry has their own side of the story, completely different to what an ordinary Gambian are thinking about the whole issue. Example, the 35 million that has been given to the Ministry of Education, which they confirmed that they did not receive any dime. In they only they also only hear it like that. And so many more. In your report, you made mention of the fish milling factory that totally disregard the regulations. In fact, I was expecting to see in your recommendation for total close down of those peace meeting factors. Thank you very much. Now, why I say that? Honorable Speaker, as of now, food is a, uh, fish is a problem in this country. Fish is a problem in this country. And we are facing so difficult times. And not only in fact the fish milling uh, uh, factories. Places like Tanji. Last week I visited Tanji. There is no simple social distancing or any of this regulation that is adhered. So if we give a 45 days of public emergency for those regulations to help us cope COVID-19 and none of it is adhered, why do we need any more days? And all these regulations have directly impacted or affect Gambian people who are suffering silently in their homes. And there is nothing that is coming 
to address those situations? Do we just want to give 45, another 45 days or another 21 days like that? No, no, no. We should not do that. Why should we do that? Honorable Speaker. I think we should do it with everything possible that will minimize the effect of this public emergency on the people. If not, we are running from our people dying, but we are also, in another way, another side of the coin, we are making our people to die silently. Yes, I am very sure of that. Because I have seen people who are dying silently in their homes. Just day before yesterday, I was called. That one of our elderly community leader in Bunu passed away just like that. And we are told that even in the funerals, these things are not adhered to. So if the regulations are not adhered to, And the regulation is making our people just to suffer and die when COVID, in fact, is not killing them. But the consequences of those laws are killing them. Why can't we look at that? The whole world now know that this virus is not going anywhere. They are now strategizing to open up. Today, we should be thinking about how to open up strategically. The public emergency was meant to stop or cut the spread of the disease. That is the reason. It was meant for that, to stop the spread of the disease through those regulations. So if those regulations are not adhered to, that means it, it will not serve its purpose. It will not. So today, what should we should be thinking of is to strategically see how best we will use our masks, we will use our hospitals, we will use our markets, so that we will be safe in both ways. So that we will stop the virus and also we will stop the other side that making people suffer, killing them, dying silently, silently in, their, in their homes. Point of order, Honorable That speaker. is what I'm expecting. Point of order. Point of order. What is your point of order, please? Um, standing order, content of speech. Standing order 29th of 1, which says every member shall restrict his or her observation to the subject under discussion. And here we are talking about a report of the special select committee. But what the member is saying is not directly affecting what is in the report. Honorable Speaker, I think. Honorable member, please. Stick yourself on the report and then you keep up the time, please. Thank you. Honorable Speaker, I don't think you will allow a double member for lower body go to waste our time when we are talking about things that are serious. Honorable Speaker. Point of order, Honorable Speaker. I'm not accepting your point of order. I'm not a member for lower body. But allow the member to go ahead, please. The procedure. Thank you. Honorable member, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. So, Honorable Speaker, I don't think my consent will allow me to support any further extension of this public emergency. 
Because as of now, we speak a point of honor. That's your point of order, Honorable Member for Papanyumi. Thank you very much. Standing order 29.5. No member shall import, Im, input improper motive to any other member. The language he used against the Honorable Member for Lower Balibu is improper. Please, Honorable Member for Papanyumi, please. You can go ahead, Honorable Member for Bundu, please, Bundu Kapunda, but please, you try to. Wind up, please, huh? Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I think the honorable members, the honorable members, please, the honorable department. member, don't respond to any other members. Please proceed with your debate, please. Honorable, honorable Speaker, their action is delivery. When you are making your point, they want to distract you. So that they need, I think they need to be consulted. Go ahead with your. Uh, Thank you very much. Go ahead with your. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. So, Honorable Speaker, as I was saying, I don't think I will support any extension of this COVID 19 public emergency. All what Gambia need now, as what the rest of the world are doing, is, think, is to think about to open up strategically. It seems that we are always behind time. When, when countries started to lock down, we were just sitting here there without making efforts to lock down. <coughs> And uh, when we wanted to lock down, there was no proper plan for the public emergency. And uh, when we approved the public emergency, the regulations were not adhered to as it's supposed to be so that it can serve its purpose because they are not observed as they should be. And if at all, what is the, the, the expectation of the, the health expert, then everybody by now in this country would have the coronavirus. So for that being the case, after when the whole 45 days has gone, without implementing properly the coronavirus adherence, we still did not have a dead case about the coronavirus. We still did not have a community, uh, uh, a local transfer of the disease within. The cases that we had came from, most of them came from Point of correction. Out, outside the country. Point of correction, Mr. Speaker. Please. Honorable member of Bununga Kunda, please continue. Correction, please. Please continue with your debate. Thank you. <laughs> so, for that being the case, I am in for zero ex uh, expansion of the <laughs> All right, speaker. With that, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Honorable members, please, uh, standing order, 
number 32-1, no member except the speaker shall interrupt a member except the speaker when he is doing his uh, deliberations. Please, let's respect that and move ahead. Thank you. Member for Brikama South, it's your turn. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the committee for the effort they have put across to come out with this report. Though it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, get uh, all the expectations of the people in the report. Notwithstanding, I commend you for the commitment you have taken to come out with this. Uh, this is a situation where it's very critical. I think everybody is here is aware of the emergence of this global pandemic, COVID-19, uh, which is affecting every living soul in this world. And it has an adverse effect on our life. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, we have to look at, um, in our own context, how do we uh, implement the containment strategy as uh, during the approval of the first extension of uh, these 45 days. Definitely, Honorable Speaker, it's very difficult to change the perception of the people in the country because the number one expectation, that is the food relief aspect of it, for people to stay put, to avoid overcrowding in order to um, uh, in order to observe the physical and social distancing can only be done if there is uh, this relief package, which up till now, uh, people are yet to adequately get what they want. And these are a problem. Uh, I just have a few observations in the report of the committee uh, regarding few areas. First of all, I just want to look at the committee observation on Burkama markets, um, where you have three bullet points. Uh, the market, the last point was the market was congested at the time of the visits. No social distancing was observed. And as I am speaking right now, it's getting worse. As if the, uh, the quality, the idle, um, the idle fit is approaching, there is this usual um, habit of uh, reducing price, what we call one tier, is going on. You find it very difficult to cross that area. So I know enforcing is still a problem, as you rightly said. It's increasing. Um, last week there was a fire incident in Fukama, which actually, if you go to the market, you will be surprised and see the uh, level of people. So we cannot effectively observe the physical and social distancing without um, providing certain food relief for people to be indoors, though it is in the progress, but when it is going to be completely done. Here is a situation where we are demanding for an expansion. Are we, are we fully guaranteed that by even tomorrow uh, enforcing these issues are going to be observed? This is our problem here. Um, if you go there, if you go to Daslam and Border Post, uh, after the committee observation, you have, um, there was an interview with the ground personnel, which reads, uh, the immigration officers have reported posting their men along some of the illegal entry route, routes into the Gambian territory. Uh, there was no official mobility at the post, so personnel motorbike of individuals are used to deploy officers. Uh, incoming Gambians are kept for quarantine, but Senegalese nationals are sent back. A holding center was available, but too small and not ideal to hold any suspect. Um, three public health officers work at the post, seven days a week, but this is usual. Um, there is usually no officer during the night. No allowance has been paid to any of the personnel. And this is where my argument is based. And if you look at um, the, the interview with the personnel on the ground, because I frequently visit these areas. These are areas whereby people are using on daily basis to access the Gambia, even whereas 
uh, we still have these people there. And even at night, because if you look at the, the, the border is so connected that people can use it, especially the way they understand it. And there are um, certain known uh, escape routes they also use on daily basis, but they heavily depend on Volkama and the surrounding for their, for, for their daily survival. So this is uh, a problem. Out of the 23 cases, one is dead. The, the, the almost 90% of these cases are imported from outside. And Senegal is number one. That surrounds us almost in three areas. So we have these porous borders, you know, enough security, and you find it very difficult for us to make sure that uh, we, we, we control these areas to avoid imported uh, uh, infection into the country. Um, if you go to the local government area, where you have the Minister of Local Government, Regional Government, and Religious Affairs, um, Madam um, Honorable Speaker, I just want us to um, put this at the back of our mind that it's not only um, the, 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 the market area that matters most. We have other areas too that also need to be looked at critically. I want to believe that the committee made certain recommendations uh, with regards to the, the, uh, the, the, to the congest the market through the recommendation mentioned earlier and then increase the opening time as follows. All the market to be open from six to four on daily basis. Uh, this is something that is important. I want to believe they don't just jump and come up with this thing. I think with regards to the market, there were enough consultation to come up with the timing, the opening and the closing of the market. Even though the social and physical distance, distancing is not observed, I think in the same way, there should be that consultation, enough religious leaders also, to come out with a to come out with a criteria that is going to that is going to be well strategic to make sure that even whereas we are going to have limited numbers in the mosque or we have timing probably for every uh, period of prayer we have some timing for them this also could be done but if we want to forget about the spirituality of the people you are creating another problem that one we need to look at it that is also very important even in the containment aspect of it because the mindset of the people need to be, to be there. So that is why the sensitization aspect is key. Because even if you look at it as high, highlighted by others, you have people, even whereas they are sick, they find it very difficult to, 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 to access the, uh, to go to the health facilities as a result of the stigmatization attack to the COVID. People are sick, they will not go. Because they said any time you go and there is any dead cases, they will relate to this thing. So people are afraid. And that is something that the, the, the national television should work on this seriously to make sure that you sensitize people enough to understand the, the, the presence of COVID in our country and as we are part of the global village. Um, the other issue I also want to talk about, um, fine, if you go back to our communities, we have families that live in extended family setup. And these family setups, you have numbers that are, they are, they are up to 50 or more now. You have limited houses and limited mattresses. How do we ask, how do we make sure that there is this physical and social distance? Sometimes you go to a household, especially these boys corners, you have more than five, six people living in the same house, one single house. So these are issues. And again, if we want to combat this thing, we have to look at everything. I'm sure if there is a number of test, uh, uh, testing done in the country, we may even register new cases. And this cannot be done without uh, the, the support in every aspect. So these are areas that we also need to look at. It. Uh, Honorable Speaker, it's very interesting we have uh, some of our government that are on government scholarship on studies in one of the most affected countries where there are zero, there is serious completely locked down. How do we ascertain the life of those people? Especially if something is not reaching to them in terms of survival. 
So all these are issues that are very, very difficult. If you look at the report, the report explains a lot of gaps that we need to bridge. How are we going to be guaranteed that if we extend this by tomorrow, there will be, um, uh, there will be enough uh, forces, security on the ground to make sure that this is implemented to the land, the enforcement aspect of it. And again, you have a lot of communities that are still without this food item. The relief package is also very key for people compliance. The reason why you are not forcing everybody to go and stay at, in their homes, because the relief package is going to reach to them. And we have to understand the end mass of the population of this country are living in abject poverty. They are daily activities. Most of them are, 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 are petty traders. So their survival depends on their daily activities. If you ask those people to be, to be, sit, to be, to be sit, sitting in their homes for completely one month, you are creating another problem. So that is why the relief package, in the soonest possible time, should reach to every household, especially the most vulnerable families. If that is guaranteed, yes, there is a need for extension. If the 21 uh, days you are mentioning is good, depending on of, uh, if depending on this relief package are going to be provided in the soonest possible time. Because if not, it's going to be difficult for us to do these things. As hi highlighted by others, you go to certain in the evening, go to the, the football parks. They are training all over. So this cannot be effective when we are not uh, serious with the relief package, it's key, it's one of the most fundamental things. And again, we are urging, let them revisit, even if there is going to be extension, let them revisit, there should be a consultation with the religious uh, stakeholders so that they can come up with a well-crafted criteria, how are we going to use our religious facilities? They are important, they are very, very important. On that note, uh, Honorable Speaker, I thank you, I want to beg to take my seat. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. May I now call on Honorable Member for Kiang East. Kiang East, please. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, being among the last person to speak, uh, most of the points that I noted that I wanted to raise have been already have already been dealt with. Uh, however, I would still uh, want to say one or two things uh, regarding uh, the report on COVID-19. Honourable Speaker. Um, Many speakers before me uh, spoke about the fact that uh, people uh, do not uh, regard this COVID-19 seriously. But I think for me, uh, the whole issue started uh, at the beginning when money issues were involved. Actually, people actually know that the COVID, uh, COVID is existing in other countries. For the, for, the, for the Gambia, the issue started when that huge sum of money, 500 million, uh, was mentioned. When the president uh, mentioned that he appropriated 500 million to fight, the, uh, to fight COVID-19. Uh, when, when that happened, uh, a lot of attention was focused on the money instead of the uh, disease, uh, because many people now are thought that people, the government, the way they handle the money, the way they manage the money, uh, many people were not happy with it, and therefore um, they said that the government is using this as a venture to make money, that the longer this COVID-19 issue uh, lingers around, the more opportunity is for the people to make money. So this is one of the reasons many people do not actually subscribe to this idea of COVID-19 and therefore they did not respect the regulations uh, that followed after the, uh, after the first state of emergency was discussed in the National Assembly here. Um, actually, 
when that first national, uh, when the first state of emergency was issue was tabled in the assembly here, uh, many people we approved 45 days. Then nobody thought that we would, we, or it was nobody's desire that you would come back here again to discuss the same issue because we thought that by the expiry of the, 40, the first 45 days, uh, this thing would have been done and over. Uh, but unfortunately, what we are seeing is the gradual increase in the number of cases that we are registering in this country. So for me, uh, that is very, very worrisome. Uh, we have a disease that is taking it's a very serious toll in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world. And this is a disease that is blooming over us as a country. And the country is very, very poor. The people are poor, the government is poor. So when we are faced with this kind of situation, at this moment, what people need to understand is the seriousness of this disease. And therefore, all hands must be on the, everybody must support, uh, the, must support the fight against this disease. Of course, when you, go everywhere, when you go around the country, of course, people definitely know that this is existing. It is existing, it's a reality, but they don't want to accept, uh, they, they don't want to accept the fact that it is, it, it is in the government because they saw it as a venture for the government to make more money, uh, which is very, very unfortunate. Now, regarding the regulations, I have made my personal observations. Uh, some of the regulations are not adhered to. Uh, for example, the open market regulation, the regulation that relates to the open markets. Uh, on the first day of Ramadan, I was in the Kama market and I was scared at what I saw. There was no suicide distancing at all. And given the nature of our society in the Gambia here, uh, may God forbid, if this disease spreads in the Gambia, it is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a total disaster. In our homes, we know we sleep in trees and forest in the beds. We share practically everything uh, from food, you know, utensils, everything we share. So if this disease happened to spread in the Gambia, well, the, the, the consequences are going to be too much for this country to bear. Now, um, when the open market regulation was, I think, revised sometime uh, uh, along the line, uh, what happened was that for the food vendors, the time that they are required to spend in the market selling, I think, was from six o'clock to one o'clock, and then thereafter, other set of sellers can come and take over the market. But what happened was that people were the effect of that was that people were given just limited time to do the shopping, so that everybody rushed to the market to do their shopping between 6 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And that resulted into a very serious congestion in the market at that time. So I think that if we have to, uh, if we have to extend this time, some of those regulations need to be looked at. And then there was also the issue of our uh, places of worship. Uh, of course, somebody mentioned here that we are carriers of messages from our provinces, uh, from our constituencies. Uh, we relate their issues in the National Assembly here. Of course, we have been receiving a lot of calls from imams, from religious people, from everybody. That look, you are closing your, you, are, you have closed down the mosque. People are not going to the mosque to pray. But there is no social distancing observed in the, in, the, in the markets. So what is the sense in that? So that area also, we need to look at it properly if you have to extend this. Maybe if it is possible, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but if it is possible, we can allow mosques to operate with limited, uh, uh, while at the same time, social distancing will be required in mosques. We can work with the mosque committees, you know, have uh, limit the number of people that can go into the mosque, depending on their status, and then frequent fumigation of the most to allow just to allow people to uh, do their uh, worship in the mosques and in the churches. That's another issue. And then there was also the issue of uh, 
the borders. You know, the report somewhere mentioned that there was no proper coordination between the Ministry of Justice and the uh, and the and the law enforcement agencies, the the the, the, the services, the, uh, the services, and I think that is true because. Uh, fighting this, putting these regulations into effect, and to make sure that they are effectively monitored and implemented, there should be coordination between all the major, all, between all the stakeholders, all the institutions that matter. Now, what I observe is that uh, in the Gambia here, uh, our borders are very porous. Of course, there are certain key areas, uh, certain key border crossing areas that can be protected. But you see, there are some settlements in the Gambia, part of which is in Senegal and part of the other part in Senegal. How do we monitor those places? How do we ensure that people do not cross from these places, uh, from other countries, uh, from Senegal into the Gambia? This is a very, very big challenge. There are also people, you know, the, uh, our borders are so that you can just walk across the Gambia into Senegal, or you can just walk uh, across into Senegal at any time of the day, even at night. So how do we monitor those things? Now, this would require the deployment of security services. Security services. But again, there are challenges. And the challenges that are mentioned in the report uh, relates to the, the issue of transportation mobility. That the security forces, yes, they might be ready to there. They are there, but they are not mobile to be able to monitor these border crossings effectively. And of course, one honorable member mentioned, and I agree entirely with him, that uh, now that the workforce in the government is reduced, many of the government officers are staying at home. Some are working from their homes. Uh, but the government vehicles are there. It would be a great idea, and it would add a lot of value to our fight against COVID-19 if those government vehicles can be impounded, actually impounded, and be given to the security forces to use to monitor and control the border. Because so far, most of the cases that we have registered so far are imported cases. Of course, we do have some local transmissions. So since the uh, the disease is spreading in Senegal. Uh, I think they have registered far more cases than the Gambia. And since it is difficult to, uh, to, 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 to control the borders, I think the security forces need to be further supported. They need to be further strengthened to be able to uh, patrol and to, to, uh, to be able to patrol the border and control the inflow of people into the country from Senegal. Uh, on that note, Honorable Speaker, um, I want to reserve the rest of my opinion until uh, the motion is tabled by the Honorable Minister of, uh, of Justice. And that's the time I'll be able to see uh, whether to support this one or not. So, on that note, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. May I now call on Honorable Member for Sarah Kunda. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. COVID-19 is a pandemic. As we sit here, we are told that over 80,000 people in the United States are dead because of the virus. More than those who died in the Vietnam War. As the slogan used to go during HIV AIDS, we are either infected or affected. So it is significant that we undertook to hold this session by virtue of the demands of our times and circumstances. Honorable Speaker, we were informed by the state 
that a state of public emergency exists and is health emergency. And under Section 35, the state is empowered to rely on an act, and the act exists, to be able to make regulations, implement the regulations in order to address the pandemic. And we were approached by the state to extend the state of public emergency from the 26th of March for, 40, for 90 days, we gave them 45 days. In those 45 days, the state has the power to make regulations, but we are informed that the regulations must be affirmed by this National Assembly. We are empowered to extend. And the state, under Section 34.3, has authority to revoke what it has proclaimed. And this National Assembly also has power to revoke any resolution we pass. Here you have the separation of powers, having responsibility to guard the interests of the people. We are discussing about the Gambian people and their interests, how to safeguard it. That is the focus. That is why the state came with regulations. Four of them, when we sat in April, and an additional one after our city. When we gave the 45 days, we also passed a motion to set up a committee a special select committee that will have some of the following functions. Ensure the implementation by the executive of the state of public emergency within the remits of the law. Ensure that government provides the necessary mechanism for the implementation of the regulations. Of course, maybe we exceeded uh, the bounds of what is reasonable under those circumstances because that is what we cannot ensure. Maybe we would have chosen uh, other uh, phrases to be able to describe what we could do. But essentially, what we intended to do is to create a committee that will serve as oversight and be able to follow up the process of implementation and report back to us after receiving the facts. In essence, we created a fact-finding mission that would be able to advise the National Assembly if there is need for the revocation or further extension of the state of emergency or for its extension. So essentially, we are given a report by the committee. We are told that the regulations were designed to combat the illness and defeat it. To do so, we need tools. And three fundamental tools are required. You need instruments. Those are the regulations. You need institutions. We'll see what the committee say about them. And you need normative practices that will lead to the change of mindsets so that we are able to serve the people by guiding them collectively towards what is essentially our common destiny 
being safeguarded. Honorable Speaker, if we look at the regulations, we'll start with them. The committee was assigned the responsibility to accompany the executive in ensuring that these regulations are implemented. These regulations are required by the Constitution to be reasonable and justifiable. So that is one assessment that would have to be done to gauge whether these regulations are fit for purpose. The essential commodities regulation powers was designed to carry out or to ensure that we uh, preserve essential commodities being available. Rice, maize, millet, flour, sugar, milk, bread, chicken, and on and on. All these are supposed to be available to ensure that they are here. They are essential, we need them, they should be available. And to ensure that they are available at reasonable prices, it also creates an element of price control. And to prevent price control being abused, it bars hoarding of the goods. It bars, it ends. implementation, it creates the essential committee, the essential commodities control committee. And that committee is supposed to supervise the enforcement of the regulation. So it creates a committee, the Solicitor General is part of the committee, Director General of State Intelligence is part of the committee, Inspector General of Police, the Commissioner General, Gambia Revenue Authority, the Chief Executive Officer Gambia Chamber of Commerce, the Executive Secretary Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. The President Consumer Protection Consortium of the Gambia. So essentially, these are people who should monitor this regulation on a day-to-day -day basis so that it will be implemented as stipulated. So one would expect then that our committee will be able to meet this particular committee to find out what the challenges were and how they sought to address them. I have not seen that in the report. Honorable Speaker, I have also with me an essential commodities emergency powers amendment regulation 2020. And it was designed to amend what is already available. Somehow, page one, we've seen it mentioned about the open markets and also the driver of commercial vehicles because we've had that people were exporting and now they are required to report uh, their whereabouts when they are carrying out these goods from the Greater Banjul area. And uh, they must not depart after 3 p.m., etc. So they must report to the police indicating uh, their destination, etc. So in short, the objective is to prevent the exportation of these goods. But the Attorney General, in his reply, may have to observe page two, where it says that may this day of 2020, no date. And there, I must emphasize again, Honorable Speaker, that we are supplied this document 
but we should really start getting these documents directly from the government printers, because they are the printers. And as an interested person, we've tried getting this regulation before parliament was convened, and we had to pay $230 for each copy. And this is just about four pages or something. That's clearly, I will not use the language, that will not be parliamentary, but four pages for $230 is, is absorbent. And the Attorney General must begin to monitor what happens at the printers, whether they are in fact available. The confusion may not be between the two institutions that we are talking about, as we see, but sometimes at the source. We've been privileged to seek the documents at the source. And at a material time, we were not able to get it. So therefore, uh, we must ensure that these gazettes at proper sources must be available. And we will ultimately recommend that all government institutions become subscribers to the Gazette so that they get direct copies once they are printed. That's the way to solve these problems. Because some of our institutions are actually working towards that direction. But here then, Honorable Speaker, there are impacts. When you say we should not export, there are impacts to that. Because Gambia has always been benefiting from the exportation for its economy. And that is why the impact assessment is important. That this committee that is established is not only securing that essential commodities are available, but what is the impact of not exporting in the economy when we rely basically on the export trade uh, for importation of quite a lot of goods and therefore for access to, to revenue. Honorable Speaker, number two, there is the closure and restriction of non-essential public places emergency powers regulation. This regulation seeks to close bars, gymnasium, museums, nightclubs, etc., etc., etc. It also goes to restrict goods to five people maintaining social distancing, it restricts public gathering uh, in, in restaurants so that the restaurants at least you buy takeaway and maintain social distancing, it uh, restricts public gathering in supermarkets so that there will be so, uh, social distancing, uh, saloons and barbershops and essentially that is the objective. Now, we must look at uh, this as a crime if you violate this, these laws and therefore uh, essentially is the police that would be responsible as no enforcement officers but specifically uh, no guidance is given and what should the police do if they are not trained on the regulation how will they enforce it is it a special squad that will be created to actually deal with the regulations. Well, essentially, uh, if enforcement is a problem, then there is some element that uh, uh, we need to inject, that is the institutions that we can rely on to be able to handle the problem. There is the third one, restrictions on public transportation emergency powers regulation. This was designed to ensure that social distancing, uh, social distancing is maintained, what I call safe, spacing maintained in the transports uh, and they should not carry more than half of what they are licensed to carry and uh, ensure that if it is a, a vehicle with four passengers that it carries only three it goes on motor bicycles you only uh, go alone or on less emergency uh, medical issues you can carry a second person and it goes further uh, the Freezing of commercial vehicles fares so that they will not increase again and uh, it creates a machinery that the uh, public garages and, and stations and transport 
uh, offices that the local government authorities of every region shall ensure that uh, there is the public garages and car parks are cleansed and disinfected at least twice a day and have hard hand washing facilities available in, and, uh, in all the areas, in, in, in those areas. So we, we are beginning to see responsibilities at the ferries, the canoes, the travel between 6 and 7 p.m., uh, maximum half, uh, essentially also protective gears being available. They must ensure that uh, they disinfect before every trip. Well, these are all responsibilities to be had. And the councils are given responsibility to ensure disinfecting those garages. Uh, air transport, similarly, that uh, where, where they come into the country, uh, they must have permit before arrival. Uh, they must, if it is a medical cargo, they must be quarantined uh, before departure. Uh, the airport and health authorities must be provided with hand sanitizers, hand, hand washing, and protective materials. Uh, they must check their temperature, etc., etc., etc. People who arrive similarly must be checked and uh, eventually quarantined if necessary. Well, these are all responsibilities to be carried. There is an amendment to, to this regulation, but the amendment basically is on the fares, increasing it. Uh, maybe they will explain to us whether that is where the freezing is, that maybe they reduced it before. What has really happened is here is an income. That's, that's what the uh, amendment is all about. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we looked at the next one, is the restriction of open markets and shopping areas, emergency powers regulation. So initially, this was meant for markets to open between 6 and 2 p.m. And then after opening, they must maintain social distancing, public hygiene, and that uh, it will be the responsibility of uh, the councils to disinfect the ma uh, markets after closure. And they were meant for those who will sell food and others were excluded. And within 100 meters, uh, people cannot sell within the 100 meters, but outside of that uh, radius, they will be able to uh, sell by maintaining social distancing. Now, it says that inspectors, the local government authorities, and the state security service shall designate their officers as inspectors to enforce these regulations. So here too, there is an element of amendment where now uh, one group, 6 to 1 p.m., and those who are selling non-food items will now be there 2 to 6 uh, uh, p.m. Now the issue is, when do you disinfect? Uh, when do you uh, sanitize? and all those issues are left untreated. What is the objective is what we should look at, and I'll come uh, to that very soon. The last one, Honorable Speaker, came uh, after our last session. That is closure of educational institutions and places of worship, emergency powers regulation 2020. That did not exist before, that's why we said that there was no regulation closing mosques. But now, they brought one, and looking at, uh, again, uh, it's not even page, there's no paging, but there is no date to it. And maybe the Attorney General will help us later to understand what is really happening in this respect. So, but what is before us, is closure of educational institutions and places of worship. And what is interesting, Honorable Speaker, is that it says that notwithstanding Regulation 2, which closes, an educational institution may be open for official use by its administrative staff. A mosque or a church may be open for the sole purpose of the call to prayer or a religious announcement of any other form. 
Does this make sense? Why say you are closing something? When in reality you are saying, for a particular purpose, it will be open. What is the use of using the word closure? Except to create confusion and misunderstanding. You do not close such institutions. You can regulate. These are easy matters to handle if we do so in good faith. Clear explanation of the illness. In fact, the religious leaders were the first to jump in explaining why preserving life is so fundamental to religion. So simply meeting them and discussing that, maybe the mosque committee, taking into consideration the importance of social, maybe the mosque committee, when it's called for prayer, will go there and call for prayer, and they, the mosque committee can pray. So that you will not say that the mosque is, is closed. So that you will not say the church is closed. The key, the clergy, can handle that responsibility. They become the custodian of their mosque, custodian of their churches. And explain to their own people why this pandemic needs to be fought. What is so difficult? And we raised this, honorable speaker, when we had this session that be imaginative, be creative. Because the objective is to get the people to take ownership. If they don't take ownership, you will not succeed. And they don't want to die. But there's so much confusion that they have no direction. So therefore, what we put as law must not be something that is so disgusting to a person that the person will feel. When you say, I have closed a mosque, what does that mean to the person? You will say that this is a draconian legislation. So what is important, Honorable Speaker, this must go. Nothing about closure. Mention when it comes to such institutions. Honorable Speaker, the regulation constitutes the instruments that our committee should have really focused on to monitor how they are being implemented, the challenges of their implementation. If there are institutional gaps, the institution that should be created to do so. duty is to add value to the work we have started. The work we have started is to realize that it's not only and in our objectives in ensuring that the lives of our people are not compromised. And that was the purpose of setting up such a committee to monitor the implementation of the regulations. Honorable Speaker, the committee facts. If we look at the facts, we will see that it informs us of what the gaps are. And I will
to help. At page 9, the committee explains What money is in that account? Well, our committee needs to provide us so that we understand uh, what this account is out to do and whether it has the financial wherewithal to be able to carry it out. But what they have identified as a source of finance is 500 million earmarked by the government. And this is supposed to go to the Ministry of Health, but they also emphasize that uh, it will which means a 600 bed uh, hospital in Sukuta. But the project does not come from funds raised by the ministry. So it means that uh, this 20 million is just from the GCCI. When is this project going to be completed? When will the beds be available? That is really uh, uh, the question, because we're dealing with an emergency. And from them, the statistics are already quoted. I don't need to go back into that. We know that we are faced with a crisis situation. Can you imagine 181,000 people being infected and they all live in a family setting? Who is left in the Gambia? All of us will be infected. So the more, I, I believe people have heard that, that one worker infected 500 people in Ghana by working in a particular company. So it means that one person can infect 500 people. So this can spread like wildfire. And therefore, it is important that we take that into consideration. And they have highlighted the dangers. If we ignore it, we do so at our own peril. The dangers are clearly highlighted by those who are specialists. They are our medical practitioners. If you are ill, you go to them. If you are ill, you go to them. What authority do you have to question their judgment? We have no authority, no moral authority, no legal authority to question their judgment. We can only assess their actions based on results. So, Honorable Speaker, they have told us the institution that is important uh, in that sense. And one would wonder, at page 31, they continue to highlight the health dimension in the fight against COVID-19. Speaking to the Minister of Health, they have seen the issues of uh, equipment that are necessary. According to them, they have all the thermometers, 500, and they have others that they have ordered. In a way, they are, uh, they are justifying that they have the equipment necessary. So it is for them to indicate what they need. And when we look at the results, the impact assessment, well, we'll see whether the equipment that they have are serving the purpose for which they intended. The issue of their staff not being properly remunerated is clearly addressed at page 32. They are saying they give them 500, or 300, or 200. 
Are they satisfied with that? What queries, and this is a day, what queries do they have? We need to know. We need to deal with the staff to be able to gather the information that is necessary. So in the area of health, we've seen a machinery created an institution, but is that institution adequate? and I hope they will come and educate us. They are the ones who told us, Honorable Speaker, that the illness, by being exogenous, had to be controlled from the borders. And that the first stage is screening. And they told us that it is this thermometer they had in the, at the borders, at the airports, to be able to screen. What did our committee discover? Are there thermometers everywhere? Because that is the fight, that is the gun. You go to war without a gun, you are dead. So the frontline fighters are the health workers. Each of them should have this in your pocket, wherever they may be, so that they will be able to continue the screening. The screening does not mean you have it or you don't have it. What is a means of port of force call to deal with the illness? So it means that not only the health workers, but they must train the security personnel who will be incorporated in this fight to also be able to have this and use it. So can we really say that all health workers or is it 10% of them, or 20% of them, or this uh, security personnel have this major instrument to fight this war? We want to know that. And this need to be, a database must be created for it, so that we know that this is what is available. Then we know our limitation, then we know how to augment to be able to fight our limitation. Otherwise, how can we fight? We must have facts. We fight with facts. Honorable Speaker, not only that, it is important to again gather from them. They tell us that some people are asymptomatic. And they come and they don't reflect all that screening. How efficiently are we controlling the borders so that whoever comes in, at least you, 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 you'll move to, to the other dimension of being controlled for a period or even being tested. They need to come up and tell us their policy. That do you move from just screening to testing? What does that entail? We need to know that. Do they have the capacity to do that mass testing? That is important. Honorable Speaker, they are the ones who also told us that once they discover certain symptoms, you must be quarantined. You must be taken to a place and kept there. We have seen the, the, the amount of money that is now being paid in the addendum to the hotels that uh, actually I don't need to go into that. We, we, we all have the document. You can see that they are being quarantined in hotels. And millions are being paid to maintain them. Catering has to be done. Millions are being paid for catering. Is that sustainable? So don't you see the need that we must move towards the preventive dimension? Because if we move further and further into quarantining, the more expenditure, and at the end of the day, that is not sustainable. So it is important, therefore, we look at that. Their own line of thinking is that you move from screening and actually observatory to take you to quarantine you so that they can observe you if they discover, then they treat you. Now, the treatment centers, we have seen MRC telling us that they have 42 beds, so that I can speed up the process. And that in Kenaba, I believe they, have, they have 10. And another place is, is like MRC is preparing itself for those number of beds. But what do we have? Sukuta? And which other quarantine center, uh, which other treatment, uh, uh, treatment center? I don't want to mention. These are the things that we need to have. 
and the places where people are being treated, their location. I don't want to get into that subset. I'm sure we should be able to get into that. What facility have we provided from the Ministry of Health to be able to do the, the treatment, the actual curing of the person? That is very significant. So to conclude the health sector, Honorable Speaker, we had talked about an interministerial task force because you are talking about finance. You're talking about environment, you're talking about the border, etc. All these people must concern not only at the level of a task force of officers under a WHO and a minister, but interministerial. Maybe it exists. We need to get that information so that they'll be able to sit down and look at these issues before regulations they will be able to consult. Then we will not come and so one institution say, I don't even know about the regulation. Who consulted who? And how can there be that without that, that, that proper consultation at that high level? So that is, that is fundamental in our recommendation. If it does not exist, it should exist. Because the right hand must know what the left, left hand is doing. Otherwise, you cannot have complementarity in action. Honorable Speaker, they have looked at institutions like trade. The committee wanted to know whether essential goods would not fall short of our needs. And we have seen the ministry talking about 37,000 tons, eventually dropping to 23,000 tons. I'm now quoting stat statistics of head because I don't want to go ahead and continue looking. So if I have any error in that, uh, yes, uh, you, you can uh, rectify it. But essentially, that huge drop, and they could only attribute it that some exportation was taking place. So it is important then to look at who the importers are because you control the stock. And how will your stock miss? So it is essential to, 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 to be able to have a regulation in, in being able to deal with those stocks to ensure that that exportation does not take place in the, in, in the first place. Honorable Speaker, it has also indicated the need to look at locally what is available. Have they actually examined whether there are stocks of rice in the country that people have produced, stocks of pools in the country that people have produced, that there is need for internal assessment of what is available locally and if need be, purchase those ones in, in the localities before we start you know, importing and say we are distributing. Some people may have stock of, 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 the, of this food at the local level, which we can purchase at the local level. So it is important then that uh, an impact assessment is done at that particular level also. Honorable Speaker, there is the Ministry of Tourism indicating the drop anticipated in, in, in the tourist industry. And the losses that are anticipated, 6.7 billion, that's not an ordinary sum, which is going to affect the hotels, the restaurants, the lodges, it's going to affect every sector of, 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 of the tourism. They're talking about 100,000 young people being late of work. 100,000 young people being late of work. So this is not an ordinary problem. Honorable Speaker, uh, we look at the issue of uh, works and communication. We, 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 we see the incoming flights that all these public enterprises, GIA, etc., will be grossly affected by the current situation. The Hajj flight will be suspended. They're talking about over 200 million. So essentially, we're talking about an impact assessment of millions that are going to be lost. And Honorable Speaker, I will uh, beg uh, to ask the committee chair to uh, tell me why he would put the state or enterprises in that uh, whole bag of providing funds of relief 
uh, for, for the state, it seems like uh, quite a number of them are going to suffer tremendous losses uh, because of, of, of the current situation, where there's fairies, etc. So uh, we would want, ultimately, uh, in their recommendation to, to activate uh, certain committees to look into this, to zero into this, to, so that proper impact assessment can be done, the threats properly seen for, for the government to prepare itself. Uh, you've seen the Minister of Finance, I'll come to them, uh, indicating that the 35 million that had been given in terms of dealing with, with the state-owned enterprises at least is being converted in some way to be able to deal with COVID-19. So these are issues that we need to look at concretely in terms of the short, medium, and long-term impact on the economy and on those institutions and their survival. Honorable Speaker, uh, we have looked at their findings at the borders, uh, at the uh, markets, etc. What I have not seen, Honorable Speaker, is talking to the market committees, uh, talking to the unions. I've seen the Gambia Chamber of Commerce. I don't want to accuse the committee of uh, being uh, business buyers and not workers uh, focused, but I, I see absence in that, that really uh, the unions, where there's motor drivers, etc. all these people should have been contacted uh, to be able to understand the impact and consumer uh, societies. All these people need to be uh, contacted to see the impact uh, on, 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 on all sectors of society. Honorable Speaker, the key institution that can facilitate the success of the fight is the Minister of Finance. And page six of the report tells us what the ministry uh, has actually been doing. At page six, the Minister of Finance revealed that 500 million pledged to the Minister of Health, 172 million had already been paid, uh, that 100 million uh, out of the 172 was added to the grant approved by the World Bank towards the procurement of ambulance, and so on and so forth, all equivalent to 12 billion. So essentially, it is important to see uh, exactly the resource base of COVID-19. And we hope that ultimately, uh, we will put all the resources together. First and foremost, we've heard from the health committee indicating the special fund that is created we need to look at this issue of special funds. We have also seen your report, especially the addendum, and it is very clear. For me, that was my major concern, and uh, we thank the committee that that element is now very clear. Uh, we are only told that there is environment, 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 but uh, how did they get the 500 million? And what is clear from uh, what they have received, the memo they received, the committee received, from the ministry is that the office of the president had environment on travel of 20 million, PMO uh, training uh, 70 million, national audit office uh, travel uh, 16 million, minister of health 50 million on consultancy, uh, centralized services uh, that is 150 million, minister of environment uh, OMVG 100 million. O OVP, uh, about two, 2 million. So the National Assembly, uh, well, PMO, 1 million. National Assembly, 4 million, that is travel. Judiciary, 2 million. PSC, 1 million. Tourism, 1 million. Justice, 1 million. Uh, Minister of uh, Finance and Economic Affairs, 20, uh, 2 million. Uh, we have agriculture, 2 million. Trade, 1 million. Health, 2 million. Environment, 1 million. Mosi, 500,000. Fisheries, 1.5 million. Mohas, 1 million. Moxwell, 500,000. Health, 
70 million. So in essence, that is 500 million. So we are being told that uh, that's where the environment actually comes. And let's look at section 29 of the Public uh, Finance Act in terms of environment uh, to see whether uh, what has happened is actually uh, the right thing that should happen and what lessons could we draw from it. Now, section 29 provides three foundations, three pillars for violence. Subsection two, section four, states that uh, there can be violence among expenditure items of a budgetary agency, which means you have a budgetary agency, a ministry, national assembly, these are all budgetary agencies. So you can have a violent of items of budget within a budgetary agency, so it goes from one to the other. Or among budgetary agencies, under the same supervising department, you have a department, three departments under a ministry. Well, it's the same budgetary agency, so you can have environment between uh, the funds of those departments. But among budgetary agencies, by the approval of the minister, in consultation with the vote controller of budget agencies. So what has actually happened here is environment across budgetary agencies. And if the minister had consulted with the board controllers, it is perfectly in order. But if the minister has not done that, then the minister should accept that there has been oversight, and then this assembly should be assured that as long as the Public Finance Act exists, that uh, will be respected you know, from henceforth. But essentially, we must look at what uh, has also been said by the, the Minister of Finance. They've indicated that in terms of the funds that they have received from the World Bank that is actually given to the Central Bank. And that uh, when it's given to the Central Bank, then in reality, the Central Bank will actually lend to the Ministry and in that sense, they have no authority to control uh, what the central bank does. That is how it is put here. Uh, I would like uh, the minister eventually to really explain the uh, rapid credit facility. Uh, there must have been some form of agreement between the IMF and the government, whether it was 20th century, 19th century, 18th century, but there must have been an agreement. And it is only the existence of that agreement, that parent agreement, that should be able to ensure uh, such development in terms of funds going into an account and being utilized without coming to the National Assembly. So we would request for the minister to search for that parent agreement so that we ultimately know from which provision uh, that this particular practice is, is, is emerging from. Without that, then we have to sit down and really look at the practice and then uh, make sure that the practice is, is fit for purpose. That is the purpose of the exercise, Honorable Speaker, that we are here to look at COVID-19 from the perspective of the national interest. As it stands, our committee has made recommendations, and I will propose that we take this report, not as the final report, if the committee chairs and members agree, but as a preliminary report, which should be beefed up by the briefing of all the elements that are here, so that a seasoned recommendation a robust recommendation could be made uh, that will come in the form of a resolution that the National Assembly uh, will adopt. Uh, that this is important that we now have the facts. What is important now is to rely on the facts to ensure that we build the mechanism that will be able to fight the fight so that we can be victorious at the end. And I hope the Ministry 
will see the especially health will see the vacuum the vacuum in building up that institutional framework for the fight i have not seen any layer of bringing the experts in the country and mobilizing them so that we build up an observatory for disease control on a permanent basis. There should be an objective of having a permanent observatory for disease control, which will definitely be guided and directed by a team of experts who will facilitate the building of the institution itself and then train the Gambians who will be able to run the institution. That is really important at, at this stage. I have also not seen that whole plan of ensuring that testing throughout the country is done with immediacy. There are plans, but we want something concrete and time-bound so that we see that this is exactly what is going to happen in two weeks, three weeks, a month. So, don't come to us this time and ask for extension of state of emergency without concretely saying, this is what we can achieve. And this is what we want to achieve concretely. And this is what is going to be visible. So in that sense, we'll be able to move forward. If they have that, then we should be able to give them 45, whatever number of days. But if they don't have that, you may end up with 25 days, you may end up with, because still we need to check whether you are fit for purpose, whether you are ready to fight this fight and lead us to fight it. That must, we must be convinced. And the regulations also must now be built up on the basis of consultation so that we do not offend sensibilities. It is said that the regulations must be reasonable and justifiable in a democratic society. And lastly, Honorable Speaker, there is an extension mandate of other elements that should be taken into consideration. If you look at Section 36 of the Constitution, it also goes to protect those people who may be arrested and detained under a state of emergency and make it a requirement to report to the National Assembly on those who are detained and, 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 uh, during a state of public emergency. So we hope that the minister will go into the whole uh, issue of of protection of fundamental rights and checking whether there is need for those tribunals to be established because it demands tribunal to be established to look at certain cases which deal with emergency powers because emergency powers are not ordinary powers. They are dealing with other issues. So uh, do you need to create that special tribunal? So it is important that we look at this uh, with greater uh, insight and hopefully we'll be able to create the machinery to be able to advance the cause of fighting COVID-19 and exterminate it before it exterminates us. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member for Surakunda. May I now call on Honorable Member for Nyanija. The floor is yours, Nyanija. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Well, if you... If the most experienced speak before you, sometimes you just tend to withdraw. But nonetheless, I'll just also contribute my quarter in the debate. But I'm going to be very, very brief because I wouldn't repeat anything that somebody has said before me. And I will speak, uh, what we are debating here is the report of the Special Select Committee that was established to monitor uh, the implementation of the state of public emergency. Honorable Speaker, I just want to thank the committee for the job they have done on behalf of all uh, the National Assembly. Definitely, they have done wonders, uh, and because they have visited almost 38 places, conduct meetings, series of meetings, and so on. So definitely, they have to be thanked because. They have sacrificed a lot. I call them frontline front workers, and I hope they are taking all the precautionary measures that are necessary, the distancing, physical distancing, during their visits to the various parts of the country. 
Not only the face mask is enough, but you have to observe the distancing. Honorable Speaker, COVID-19 is something which you know that is affecting the world globally, and it is not a, it's not something new. We all know. We've been hearing and we've seen until it has reached us. So what we need to do as a country is to respond. And in responding, we definitely need the efforts of all. Everybody needs to put in something to make sure that we are protected. As you know, and as the saying goes, prevention is better than cure. Uh, definitely looking at the health system, if you want to compare our state of the health system with the, with the countries that are most affected today, you will tend to lose hope. But still, there are opportunities. Let us observe the regulations and guidelines that are given by WHO and that of the Ministry of Health for us to be safe and protect ourselves, protect our families, and also protect the entire nation. Honorable Speaker, the only point that I want to emphasize is the health workers. They definitely deserve commendation, the frontline workers. And I definitely concur with the recommendations that they make with regards to the Ministry of Health that the Special Committee have made. And I think it's just a matter, it's a matter of like, you see, I can still I call it carbon copy of the previous recommendation the Health Committee made to the, before this plenary. Because uh, looking at the health system, definitely they are challenged in all, in various ways and means. But, Honorable Speaker, one thing that we need to emphasize here as parliamentarians is for the Ministry of Health and that of the Ministry of Finance and also us, the parliamentarians, to make sure that those whom we know that they are sacrificing their lives when, when we are sleeping and whom, when, when, we, when we are staying in our homes or when we are doing whatever to make sure that we are safe, Definitely, they need to be protected and protected maximum to the maximum level, and also they need to be motivated because it is not easy to risk your life for something, and uh, at the end of the day, you are not well motivated. Definitely, and I think it is a matter that should be taken by the uh, Special Select Committee and also this, uh, the National Assembly Select Committee on Health in particular to be engaging the Ministry of Health to see, and also the Ministry of Finance to see how best uh, uh, the frontline workers can be motivated, especially the health workers. So, Honorable Speaker, as I said earlier, I don't wish to repeat what has been said here, because all the points that I have have been dealt with by the previous speakers. I just wish to stop here and once again thank the Special Select Committee and also the frontline workers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Nyani for your brief intervention. May I now call an honorable member for Tumana. Brief. Thank you very much, honorable speaker. It's a long day, um, and I will equally join my colleagues in uh, thanking the special committee uh, for the job well done. Uh, Indeed, we are in a very trying moment. As a country, but then we have to sacrifice. This is the, the only thing that we have under this uh, surface of the sun. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we were here last month to pass a regulation but again, looking at the realities on the ground, I realize that we try to solve a, a, a problem, but in doing so, the regulation that we passed here, we created another trouble or problem. That is the time frame that was in the regulation for essential commodity sellers in the market to operate from 6 a.m. to 2 o'clock. I mean, hadn't been, the time was like from 6 a.m. to 5 or another 6, 6 p.m. that will at least give chance to a lot of people to go to the market at their own convenient time. 
But then, when that did not happen, uh, everybody has to rush within that time frame from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is why there was a problem that we cannot even address because you cannot ask people to stay back home without feeding their families, and they cannot feed their families without going to the market. So I think uh, this recommendation from the select committee that you know the market has to be open from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, I think uh, this is a point that I really uh, uh, like and I will also want to advocate and again to convince others to support it. If need be, if we can extend it to like 5 o'clock or 6, so that you know those that are working in the uh, uh, public sectors or even in the private sectors, so that when they come back home, they can also uh, use the, the few hours to go to the market to do their shoppings, so that you know they can feed their families. Honorable Speaker, uh, laws refers to the system of rules and regulations that a member of the society has to uh, apply uh, in both our private and public lives in the interest of peace, good governance, and the recognition of individual interests. And again, no system of government can operate effectively when uh, there is no law or when people are not paying attention to those laws. So these have shown beyond reasonable doubts looking at the report or going through the report that the, what the regulation is saying and uh, the realities on the ground in our markets, in our football fields. In fact, we said no to public garden, but you, st you still have some people going to the football field playing football. I mean, going to the market is overcrowded. Going to the ferries is overcrowded. Week before last, I traveled to Nyumi. I don't know whether upper Nyumi or lower Nyumi, uh, a village called Kermama. But flying through um, uh, Banyun to the ferry terminal, when I was at the ferry terminal, I was looking at the entire situation there. I mean, I asked myself a question. What's the essence of coming up with regulations when those regulations are not being adhered to? And as members of parliament, we have a responsibility. The primary responsibility of this parliament is to make laws. But again, we are in the partnership with the executive to make sure that they know all the laws that are made in this parliament, they need to be enforced. Our responsibility is to make laws, but the responsibility of the executive is to make sure that they know the laws that are made by the parliament have been implemented. So if those laws are not being implemented. I mean, I see no reasons why we should uh, be coming up with other laws. Let us make sure, as parliament, we follow the executive. Let us play our part. And again, we follow the executive to make sure that you know, they play their parts so that the purpose of coming up with some of these laws would not be defeated. Let us interact. Let us know if they are constrained in terms of human resources, if they are constrained in terms of capacity, if they are constrained in terms of money. We make sure that you know, we support them because this is a trying moment for the world, most particularly this country, the Gambia. And all hand has to be on deck, regardless of, regardless of our political affiliations, our religion, our gender, and whatsoever. This is a trying moment. Our responsibility is to make sure that we protect each and every Gambian. It is a primary responsibility on us to make sure that we protect each and every Gambian. So there, we have to put aside our differences, not only politics, 
to make sure that you know we support one another in this trying moment. There are a lot of people suffering out there. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, going through the report, we go to page six. The Ministry of Interior. And with your permission, the Minister of Interior reported that those who are to enforce the regulation, security services has no prior, prior training on any of the regulations. I mean, this is a cause of concern. When we met here last month, this is what I was trying to raise. Those who are supposed to implement these regulations, they should know these regulations to their fingertips. In as much as we want to protect our citizens, we should not also violate their rights. They have a right. You cannot just come and, I mean, find people sitting at a place, you just jump on them, trying to violate their rights. I think I am not very far from Larikuna Market. Most of the vendors are coming to me lodging a complaint that the police sometimes are coming. They will seize their, 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 their second-hand clothing or some of the materials that they have there, asking them to pay a certain amount of money. What I will ask them is that, do you have any evidences that this is what they ask you to pay? They will say no. So if the people that are supposed to protect the people and their properties, and their, I, mean, I mean their properties, are the ones violating their rights. That's, 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 that's really very bad. So the Minister of Interior, this is not a surprise. When I was watching the committee having an engagement with the Minister of Interior, saying that you know, they don't even lay their hand on the, on, on the regulation, I think this is going a long way in trying to jeopardize the effort that this parliament is making. We should not, we should not let this happen. Let us make sure that, you know, the, the people that are supposed to implement these uh, regulations know this regulation to their fingertips so that, you know, they will try in as much as they want to, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, protect the people from catching this virus. But they will, it, it will also go a long way in trying to, I mean, uh, uh, prevent them from violating their rights. Honorable Speaker, going again, I, I think we also have to look at the, 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 the prices of basic commodities, uh, of some of these uh, uh, essential commodities, I mean. I mean, the prices of them, like uh, uh, when we were here last month, a bag of rice in the Upper River region is costing like $1,250. But now that the price of fuel has gone down drastically in the world market, and even in the Gambia, the price of this fuel has gone down. This should have an impact on the price at this moment. When, they, when, when, when the price was at $100, for instance, the price of fuel per barrel of, uh, yes, per liter was $100. Now that it has dropped to $50, I, 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 I really want uh, the committee to look into that, to make sure that you know, they engage the right authorities, to make sure that they, they, it also reflects on the price of those commodities. Because most of the time, what, they, what, they, what the businessmen will complain is that uh, we, we normally transport these commodities from, uh, from, from, from the, from the rural, uh, urban, 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 urban areas to the rural areas. So I think that has to be looked at because most of the people in the provinces are the one feeling what is happening in this country. So that has to be looked at. Going through the report again, page eight, where you have an engagement with the religious leaders. Honorable Speaker, the way we are going as a nation, it will indeed kill our religious commitment in the hearts, mind, and soul of our young people. 
or the population. We will be very relaxed and lackadaisical in our worship. And that has a lot of impact on the life and the livelihood of, this people, of the people of this country. Honorable Speaker. And the impact will be, it will raise the crime rate in this country. Because most of the people in this country, especially the young people, most of the young people in this country are not involved in crimes because of their religious perspective. But the moment people are staying at home without going to the masjids, observing their compulsory prayers and even Juma prayers, Honorable Speaker, is making people relaxed. And that is not good for the country. And in fact, for me, I see no reason why we should even close down the masjids now. Because in this country, especially in the rural Gambia, you see a family of 40 or 45. 20 of them will be living in a single room or 15 or 10 of them will be living in a single room. Again, most of all, the, all those people, like 10 of them, will be eating from the same basin. And again, you go to the deep into the interior, where you have these big marabouts with, with their talibes. Some of those marabouts have have, have uh, more than 300 talibes in, in, in their compounds, and they are all living in these single, single, single rooms. So if these are some of the things that are happening on the ground, I see no reason why we should uh, uh, close down the masjids and the churches uh, of worship. Going by again, the relief packages, I think this is not only to the government but to every stakeholder in this country. And in, be, be it an individual, uh, be it a philanthropy, be it government itself, let us try, by all means, we help the marabouts on the ground. Because most of these marabouts have 600, 500, 300 children that are living with them in their compounds. And in fact, to my surprise, week before last, when I was going to my constituency, I met a series of children under the age 12 and 14. They are, they, are, they are these talibes that are begging in the streets. So if we cannot provide food for these marabouts, obviously the children in, those, uh, uh, I mean, in, in the household of those marabouts, obviously they will go out and look for food because they have to survive. They are Gambians and they are humans. So please, be the political party, a philanthropy, an individual, or government. Let us make sure that you know, we help these people so that you know, uh, 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 they will not be vulnerable to uh, the, the, the virus that we are talking about. Going through the report again. Page 10, the local government authorities, LGS, indicated that the enforcement of the emergency power regulation will continue to pose huge challenges as the councils that are part of the key implementing authorities have neither been consulted nor served copies of the regulation to comprehend uh, their content. I think this is also another important thing. Um, we should all be stakeholders in this. We are all journeying towards protecting the lives of each and every Gambian, or even a non-Gambian residing in this country. So we should try by all means, whatever we are doing, we are doing it in the interest of our nation. Any stakeholder that is involved in the fight against this COVID-19, 
let us make sure that you know we try to engage each and every individual or stakeholders so that you know the purpose of our fight would not be defeated because like it was alluded by the member of Woolly West, we are fighting an enemy that we are not even seeing, an invincible enemy. So if other stakeholders are left behind, I mean, it will be very difficult to uh, uh, meet our target. So therefore, I want each and everyone uh, to, be, uh, to be part in this fight so that you know we can defeat the invincible uh, enemy. Going through it again, where you have the oversight monitoring tool, the objectives, page 12. Uh, there is a question that I want to ask, if the chair can just uh, set light on that, though he's not here, but the, 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 the committee members are here, where you say the, number, uh, um, the essential commodity shops were still open at 1 a.m. So I just want to know whether if you engage those people to know why they are still operating at that point in time, so that you know you can at least let us know what we need to do so that you know uh, we address that issue. Um, two, where you have the Barra Ferry Terminal. The waiting set was clear of passengers but the corridor from the vehicle entrance leading to the ramp was crowded uh, with waiting passengers. So it's like we are clearing here and uh, dumping them at the other side. So I think this is something that we have to look at because um, as, in as much as we are trying to fight this uh, COVID-19, it is going to be very difficult. Uh, you, it's like you're solving the problem here and creating another one there. So that has to be looked at. And again, the same thing goes on, where you have the Farafenia Hospital, uh, the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, but here, I wanted to ask uh, where you have the uh, page 18, number 13, Sabi Border Post. Some frontline staff has been paid their allowances, but there were orders who reported that they were not paid. They reported, the sum, uh, they reported that some were paid who were not entitled to. So I don't know whether if the committee made any finding in this, because this is unacceptable. Someone who did not deserve to be paid is paid. Someone who sacrifices his life, time, energy, and resource for the, for the nation to make sure that you know the people of this country are protected. You ignore that person and give money to someone who don't deserve the money. This is corruption, it's, 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 it's tantamount to corruption. So I don't know whether if the committee made any finding in that, because the frontline workers, in us, no, matter what we, no matter how we try it, we cannot pay these people. They are sacrificing a lot. For me, by 10 a.m., I'm going to bed until 6 a.m. again. But these people are the one in this fight, we don't need soldiers. We don't need atomic bombs. We don't need RPGs or machine guns. But these are the people that we need to do the fight, the necessary fight. So if they are frustrated in the entire process, honestly, this is unacceptable. You cannot be at the front, for, forefront for two, three days, four days, five days, one week without being paid. And at the end of the day, you are following the right authorities to make sure that you know you load this complaint. So if National Assembly go, went there, I mean, these should have been asked who are those that receive this money and they should not be entitled to it. And who are those who were not paid and they're supposed to be paid to do justice to those people. So it's like the same thing is continuing here. I think there is one more point that I want to 
Okay. Where you have Banyu Albert Market, committee's observation, most of the shops that we are not supposed to open at the time of visit were closed. So this is Banyu Albert Market. But this is not applicable to other markets in the country. So we need to know what are some of the reasons that led to this. Because maybe the people of Banyul are aware of the cognizance of this COVID-19. But likewise, maybe the people of Basse are not. So what, do, what, what is the gap? What do we need to break those gaps? This is something that the committee has to look at uh, to do justice to those people there too in the Upper River region. Uh, and the other thing is the Lumos represent markets in our various uh, communities or regions or districts. So if time can be given to uh, people to go to the markets here to look for their livelihoods, I think the committee also has to look into that dimension to make sure that you know, uh, people also access Lumos. Because right now, I have a lot of people in my constituency who produce a lot of onions. I myself, I, I bought a lot of onions from them, but up to now, they still have a lot of their onions with them, and they still cannot sell them. As a result, they used to take them to the, uh, uh, to the Lumos on a Lumo days. But right now, Lumos are closed, and they cannot go to the Lumos. The Basel market that we rely on, that market has been bound into asses. So means we have, we, we already have what we can eat, so the excess is what we used to sell to feed our families and to take care of our other necessities. So if that is not happening, like the Lumos are not open, uh, uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, for the people uh, uh, to feed their families, especially in the Upper River region, most particularly Tumana constituency. So it's the same thing again, like uh, not allowances has been paid to any of the personnel. So this is, a, this, I mean, this is a complaint that's coming from all angles, center, left, right, down, east, west, north, south. I mean, we, let's, let's try, let, let us try and do justice to these people. It's going to be very difficult at this trying moment. You cannot leave your family at your, I mean, at your compound. You are there for like one, two, three, four days, one week or two weeks without I mean, given the entitlement that you are entitled to, it's going to be very difficult. You cannot leave your family there I mean, while they are hungry. So we have to look into this. And most of these uh, fishing sites too, uh, we have to look into this area. This is one of the areas where our neighbors are getting into our country without our notice. And Gambia, we don't have any problem. Internally, to me, we don't have any problem. In fact, we can, we can let life resume again. Let's go back to our normal business. If we can guarantee that we are going to protect our borders, the only problem that we have in this country is our borders. Our borders with our neighbors. And again, we cannot control those borders, 100%. But what we need to do is, let us try to go down to their level. That's the level of the local authorities in our various constituencies and regions. For instance, if you go to Basi, you engage the regional governor, you engage all the chiefs in the district, you engage all the VDCs, you engage all the, uh, um, how do you call it again, um, all the alikalis, to make sure that, you know, let them be their own police or their own securities. But this cannot be done without sensitizing them. They need to know about the realities of COVID-19. Up to now, let us keep on trying. Eventually, the door will let us in. Let's keep on trying. You cannot just convince everybody at a go. But let's keep on trying because this is a matter of dead and living. And we cannot choose, I mean, uh, dead over life. We cannot do that. This is the people that we need to protect. Most of the people don't even have access to some of this information that many are having in the urban areas. Like in my constituency, only two or three or five communities have electricity. So radio, some will not even bother themselves to listen to radios. So we have to make this, I mean, as a priority to make sure that you know we sensitize our people. 
Sensitization again, there is one point that the majority leader made mention. That's the use of the traditional communicators. These are the people that have a lot of influence on the life of the people in our various regions. Let us use them. In fact, some of those traditional communicators, they have groups. They are already registered. Let us make, make best use of them. Many people listen to them. So the moment we use them, they are going to inseminate some of the information that cannot reach last, like the, the last village in Kantora constituency or the last village in Wuli East constituency. But with the, with the help of these uh, traditional communicators that will pave a way whereby everybody will have access to some of these informations. So, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Speaker, uh, with these few remarks, I want to conclude. Uh, okay, let me add one. Okay, then I conclude. Move a motion. Honorable Member, thank you very much, but it's not a few remarks. You've taken a long time. I have no control over you on that. But uh, a gentle reminder. Motion. Add a motion. But Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. I want to move a motion for us to adjourn till tomorrow, 10 o'clock, because uh, many people are observing this uh, fasting period. Thank you. No. <laughs> yes. Sorry, to Monday, please. <laughs> to Monday. Motion. <laughs> so, sorry, honorable member. Um, we'll still move ahead, work according to the program. Your motion cannot be accepted. There's a motion on the floor. Can the floor. I call honorable, on speaker. honorable member? Honorable Hello. member. Honorable, honorable speaker. Honorable. There's a motion on the floor. The procedure is. No, no, no. No, 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 May I now call honorable member for Sami, please? Honorable speaker, there is a motion on the floor. Honorable member. What? That said motion on the floor. You are not asking. No. There could be counter motions, but there is a motion on the floor. Yes. No, 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 I don't think this. It will certainly interrupt our program. Honorable Speaker. I want to move that the assembly sit beyond 6 o'clock. Yeah, please, can somebody move we sit beyond the 6 yes. o'clock? Honorable Speaker, there, speaker, there, is, speaker, there is a motion. The there is motion on the floor. Let's there discuss on, on the that. There is Let's motion on the floor. But, but, no. Please. Let, let, let's have the Procedure wise. Have the motion. Have the motion. Let's, motion. Let's, motion. let's follow let's procedure, let's please. There is a motion on the floor. Hey, please, can you move your motion proper and the court a relevant standing order section? Honorable Member for Cantora. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm rising on the st uh, standing order 53, most of without uh, no notice, for us to um, adjourn by 6 o'clock. Thank you. Standing order what? What number? Honorable Speaker, we want to adjourn the debate till Monday, 10 o'clock. On the Senate, order 53C. Bagarasa. Counter motion. Honorable Speaker.
Yeah, motion. want to compromise with him and it be tomorrow. Now, honorable members, honorable member for Cantora, um, I've agreed to your motion, but um, I'm appealing that uh, instead of uh, adjourning the session till Monday, can we not meet on Saturday tomorrow? Because the public, state of the public emergency expiring on Monday. Please, can you, can you? Hello, no, no, the motion, motion must be seconded first. Saturday. Can you ask him to stop, don't Look, mind others. Can you please amend your motion to Saturday, tomorrow? Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I withdrew the first motion and I'm also making, to, to amend the first motion that is, I rise on the standing order 53C of the standing orders to raise the motion that we suspend this debate until tomorrow, Saturday, 10 a.m. prom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Any seconder? Any seconder? Yes. Kian, Kian Central? Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I rise to second the motion. Counter motion, Honorable Speaker. Counter motion. Yes. No, no, no. You finish this thing, I say. So come in here again. Honorable members, debate on this motion. It's now adjourned till tomorrow. Counter motion. Counter motion. So, okay. Counter motion. Yeah. Take a yeah. vote, honorable. Counter motion. Yeah, it has been moved and seconded. Yes. Yeah, come to the debate on the Honorable Speaker, take a vote, please. Yeah. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the debate of uh, this report to be to adjourn tomorrow saturday at 10 a.m prompt those in favor please say aye aye those not in favor please say no no, no. the eyes have it no 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 there is division there is division there is division let's count let's vote let's vote Let's vote. Let's vote. There is serious division. Let's vote. Those, those in favor to adjourn to tomorrow, Saturday, in the morning, 10 a.m., those in favor, please raise your tarts. Raise your hands. Yes, those in favor. Those in favor for tomorrow. No, no, no. Please. please, 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 don't do that. Those, you are counting them. Okay, Alifa also. You, you have how many? You have how many? Yeah. Those not in favor, let them say no. Those not in favor, please raise your tag. Procedure, procedure, procedure.
consiglio, mai nel consiglio. No, no, no. no, no. Eh, 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 pro, prosidio Yes. 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 On that basis, the eyes have it. No. The debate is now adjourned till tomorrow, 10 a.m. prompt. Um, accessories, 